Now we're going to move uh, along the lifespan trajectory, and I get the great honor of uh, welcoming Chicago's own, uh, Dr. Olu Adjilori. He's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois in Chicago, my favorite Chicago institution. Uh, he graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University with a degree in biology. He then went on to do an MD PhD at Stanford, so he was aiming pretty low there. Um, and he did some work with um, one of my favorite HPA axis uh, researchers. And then uh, <clears throat> he was studying the uh, deleterious effects of stress hormones on the brain with Sapolsky. He's won a number of awards, including the ICGP uh, Junior Investigator Award, the Advanced Research Institute and Geriatric Mental Health Scholar Award, the University of Illinois College of Medicine Departmental Faculty of the Year Award, just a, a few years ago. He's currently uh, doing too many things to mention here. I should also mention that he was the co-winner of the um, Mood Challenge for the Apple uh, and an, um, Apple Mood Challenge uh, with Bioffect, and I think he's going to show us some of that data today. He's currently using novel multimodal neuroimaging techniques in mobile health technology to better understand internalizing psychopathology. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Olu Adjilori. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody, and I first want to thank. Um, Scott and Mary for uh, inviting me to be a part of this wonderful panel with uh, folks whose work I really admire. And, um, and I want to welcome you to Chicago as well. Let's see if I can find my talk. All right. So here are my disclosures. Um, whenever I do a talk on brain connectivity, I like to start with a picture of this gentleman. Uh, his name is Sir John Batty Took, and he was one of the most influential psychiatrists of the late 19th century. And he was remarkable for, for several reasons. One is that he was a big proponent of the humane treatment of patients, and he was in charge of one of the large asylums in Scotland. He was also the president of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. And he was an early proponent of what Edward Shorter calls the first biological psychiatry, where he really believed that mental illness resides in the brain. And through a better understanding of neuroanatomy, physiology, and pathology, can we truly understand uh, mental illness? And he had a remarkable series of lectures that were collected in this book called The Insanity of Overexertion of the Brain, where he talked about a lot of his biomedical theories for different psychiatric disorders. And I know um, Dr. Parianti was talking about the 1990s when referring to inflammation and depression, but in the 1890s, he actually proposed some theories that inflammation might be behind um, bipolar disorder and major depression. Another thing that he said in this uh, remarkable series of lectures is that mental action is a function of connections. And when the continuity of these connections is destroyed, interrupted, or structurally impaired, modification of function must ensue. And so he recognized the importance of brain connectivity and, this and the disruptions in these connections in the pathophysiology of, of um, major psychiatric illnesses. And 150 years later, NIH basically said the same thing, talking about disrupted and aberrant connectivity being implicated or suspected in the etiologies of disorders not previously considered from this perspective. But as I just told you, they have been previously considered from this perspective, and what's different are the tools and the technology that we have to study this, as described by the previous speaker, uh, Dr. Whitfield Gabrielli. And among those tools are um, connectomics, neuroimaging, and graph theory. And the basic idea is to take the brain and abstract it into a network and then apply graph theory functions to characterize the brain as a network. And we can see how it functions as a network and in the context of psychiatric illness, malfunctions um, as a network. And some of the common um, graph theory metrics that you'll see in the literature are path length or network efficiency and nodal centrality. And path length is basically the number of edges that connect any two nodes in a network or any two brain regions in a network. And in this case, you see three edges or three connections connecting nodes I and J. And the inverse of the path length is efficiency. So the greater the path length, the, um, the worse the efficiency, the shorter the path length, the better the efficiency. Another common graph theory metric that you'll see in the literature is um, nodal centrality 
or hubs in brain networks. And I know many of you who flew into Chicago flew in through O'Hare, and O'Hare is a hub in our air transportation network. And so if you were to characterize O'Hare's role in terms of uh, uh, its centrality, it would have very high centrality. And so people have applied these graph theory metrics to the, our understanding of mood and anxiety disorders, and here are some of the findings. Um, some studies have shown reduced global network efficiency in anxiety disorders. Similarly, you see reduced network efficiency in mood disorders, both unipolar depression and bipolar disorder. And these reductions in network efficiency correlate with symptom severity and processing speed. In addition, our lab and others have shown altered centrality in the default mode network, which you just heard about, as well as limbic regions. Um, but these studies are based on either structural connectomes or static correlations. And increasingly, you're seeing people focus on time-varying connectivity or dynamic connectomes. And these studies have shown things like inc uh, altered dynamic functional connectivity in the default mode network in major depression as well as these altered um, dynamics correlating with abnormal cognition associated with mood disorders like rumination in the context of adolescent depression. Um, in addition, uh, in bipolar disorder, altered dynamics have been associated with reduced cognitive function in terms of impaired processing speed and executive function. And these dynamic connectomes have been cleverly dubbed by uh, Vince Calhoun as the connectome. And so this is another um, old idea as well. Uh, the, this dapper young gentleman, when he wasn't so dapper or young in his seminal work, The Principles of Psychology, said thought is in constant change and that this change occurs in sensible intervals of time. And so one of the things we wanted to answer in our lab is whether we can use dynamic connectomes to characterize this change and to see if this change occurs over sensible intervals of time. And to do this, we looked at um, EEG-derived connectomes because of the high temporal resolution. And these connectomes are defined um, by the weighted phase lag index, which is a measure of the connectivity between various channels. Um, and then we applied a sliding window approach uh, to look at the dynamics. And uh, first, an arresting state study done by Maggie um, Shing in uh, collaboration with Heidi Klump, we looked at just resting state um, connectivity in these EEG connectomes across different frequency bands. And she found a selective um, effect in these anxious patients of increased theta connectivity. And this increased theta connectivity also correlated with the degree of anxiety. So the more anxious you were, the higher the theta connectivity. And this also translated to some of these graph theory metrics where we see reductions in the path length of the theta network selectively. So when we looked at our dynamic connectomes, we focused in the, theta, in the theta band, and we looked at dynamic connectomes while participants were doing an emotion regulation task, where they're instructed to either look at a neutral stimulus or to look at a stimulus designed to generate negative affect, maintain that negative affect, or try to reappraise it. And we used um, a data-driven approach that we affectionately call the thought chart, but is really um, graph dissimilar dissimilarity embedding that's used to describe the intrinsic geometry of all connectomes over all time points. And so what we do is we first take all connectomes from all subjects and all time points, and we embed them in a S by T dimensional space where S is the number of subjects, T are the number of time points. Now this um, high dimensional space is described by Euclidean distances, which actually does not capture the true geodesic distance between each connectome in this high dimensional space. So to, to discover the true geodesic distance, which is represented here um, by this curved arrow, we use unsupervised manifold learning. And once we do that, we can derive a network of networks where the distance between networks are the true geodesic distance. And this high dimensional space, as I said, is the number of subjects times the number of time points. And in the case of this study, we had 130 time points, we had 40, sub 40 subjects, and we had three different tasks, neutral, maintain, and reappraise. Um, now it's difficult for me to visualize in 15,000 dimensional space, so we use um, different techniques to try to visualize this data after we've discovered this intrinsic geometry. Um, one way to visualize it is to use a minimum spanning tree, which allows us to look at network of networks in a clustered fashion. 
And then we can also use nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques to visualize this data in 3D space. And so looking at the minimum spanning tree, we can see that um, each dot here is a different connectome from a different time point, and we can see the distribution of these connectomes across this tree as a function of the task um, shown here and as a function of what subject group they belong to. And as you can see, like towards the left side of the tree here, it's predominantly healthy control subject connectomes, and on the right side, it's the socially anxious connectomes. So it's able to separate them by group and by task. And on the next slide, you can actually see these trajectories. And these are the mean trajectories for controls while doing the neutral part of the task, maintain and reappraise, and also for the anxious patients while doing different parts of the task. And when you take a top-down look at these trajectories, you can see that they occupy different parts of the space, where healthy controls while doing neutral are here, while doing maintain are here, and while doing the reappraised part of the task are here. And you can see that um, while uh, anxious patients are doing reappraised, they're literally all over, the, all over the place, and we can quantify this. And so here's it quantified as trajectory length. And in healthy controls, we see this nice stepwise increase as you go from neutral to maintain to reappraise as, it, as you increase task demands. Um, the anxious patients actually start off pretty high and as if they're revved up already. And it's hard for them to increase their gain to do the reappraisal part of the task. And this is actually shown here where um, using, looking at the ERQ reappraise uh, subscore, Subjects that tend to use reappraisal in their day-to-day -day life have lower trajectory lengths. The ones that have the longer trajectory lengths are less likely to use reappraisal in their day-to-day -day life. And so we think this has to do with some kind of cognitive effort while doing the task, or um, even the speed of thought while doing the task. And as an example of this, we've applied this method to meditation practitioners and here you're looking at the minimum spanning tree, and it actually clusters connectomes according to different tasks that these meditation practitioners are doing, whether they're doing active thinking, breathing, or meditation. And we can see that um, it actually correlates to, to the degree that they can actually practice mindfulness. So the better that they can practice mindfulness, the more they can reduce their trajectory lengths. So we think that this notion of trajectory length as discovered by this unsupervised manifold learning technique is related to this notion of mental motion, which was described by Emily Pronin and Alana Jacobs, where you can sort of map positive and negative affect according to speed of thought or variability of thought. So we see that altered uh, theta network properties are associated with anxiety. And they also um, may represent cognitive effort during motion regulation. So one of the things we want to see is whether these altered network properties could serve as a target for intervention. So we have a pilot study done in collaboration with Flavia Froelich, um, being conducted by my research assistants, Robbie Shepard and Lindsay Stewart, where we get um, a resting state scan, and we determine what edge in the EEG connectome has the higher, highest theta connectivity and we target that for transcranial alternating current stimulation in the theta band, and then we measure the effects of that stimulation. And we have some really exciting early pilot data suggesting that um, active stimulation can reduce uh, theta connectivity in the targeted pair of connecto, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in the targeted pair of electrodes um, greater than sham stimulation, and active stimulation reduces uh, state anxiety to a greater extent than sham stimulation. So this is very early results, but we're excited that we're on the, uh, um, on the right track here. So um, what I've shown you so far is that dynamic EEG connectome properties can characterize emotion processing and emotion regulation, and that these altered network dynamics may serve as a target for network-based interventions. And so our lab has extended um, the notion of network approaches to mood and cognition to look at the network of smart and connected devices that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was happy to see a lot of posters yesterday where people are using wearable sensors and voice input and machine learning to make inferences about uh, mood in a passive way. And we've been doing that with um, smartphone keyboards. And you can see the emerging literature on smartphone um, and mental health and psychiatry. It's been an exploding field. And we jumped in the fray in uh, 
around 2015 under the leadership of uh, Dr. Alex Liao, and she had been working on a keyboard that replaces the default keyboard of your smartphone to track how you type and not what you type. And we entered this app into the Mood Challenge that was sponsored by Apple and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and we were fortunate enough to win and get some money to support the development of the app for the iOS platform. And the motivation behind developing this app is um, some of the problems that we have with our, our current ways of assessing um, mood and cognition in a clinical setting. Um, one, it's subject to reporting biases like recall bias or recency bias. When I ask my patients in clinic how they're doing and if they got into a car accident on the way there, they're going to feel awful and not remember all the gains that they've had in the weeks prior. Another thing is that it's asynchronous. Oftentimes we're asking about information not in real time. And then it's subjective. As I said, it's, it's subject to all kinds of biases. And it's also done in an artificial environment, either in the clinic or the lab setting, and it would be great if we could capture this data in, in the wild, so to speak. And so as I said, um, the BiEffect uh, app, the core technology is a keyboard that replaces the default keyboard and allows us to track keyboard metadata, things like typing speed, autocorrect usage, and backspace usage. And it works in conjunction with a, a, an entire workflow that's supported by Sage BioNetworks to handle the data on the back end. We send de-identified data to Sage. And we also have, as part of the app, um, onboard neuropsychological testing. So we have a go-no-go -no -go task and a trail-making task that's part of the app. And we were fortunate enough to connect with Melvin McInnes and Kelly Ryan at the University of Michigan to study an early version of this app um, with the Prechter Longitudinal Study, a bipolar disorder study. And those subjects also did daily um, ecological momentary assessment ratings of their mood, impulsivity, energy level, and rapid thinking. And they also had clinician rated scales done on a weekly basis, the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression and the Young Mania Rating Scale. And one of our first studies um, on this data was published by John Zulueta, who's a clinical informatics fellow at UIC. And he looked at just a few subjects, but even with a few subjects, I want you to appreciate the amount of data that we're collecting, where we get up to 70,000 keystrokes, 740,000 accelerometer readings over about an eight-week period. And this is just to show you what that data looks like. Here is um, inter-T delay, which is one of our measures of typing speed, accelerometer displacement, and keystrokes. And those were among several predictor variables that he put into a mixed um, effects regression model to see if we could um, successfully predict clinician rated scales for depression and mania. And putting all of these predictor variables like um, interkey delay, backspace ratio, autocorrect, um, things like session length and session count into this model, he was able to successfully um, uh, predict young mania rating scale scores as well as Hamilton depression rating scale scores. And when you do a deep dive as to which um, predictor variables are common predictors across scales, things like accelerometer were significantly associated uh, for both um, uh, mania and depression. And then if you look at what's distinct, we saw that less backspace is associated with greater manic symptoms, which we think is related to reduced self-monitoring, right? If you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you don't care about the backspace. Um, and then more autocorrect was associated with higher depression scores, so we think that's related to inattention. We've also used machine learning techniques in collaboration with folks in computer science. This is a work done by um, a former graduate student, Bokai Kao, working with Philip Yu, where they took the same data but fed it into a gated uh, recurrent neural network and then used a late fusion model to see if we could predict mood scores that way. And using a um, binary depression classification, they had a 90% accuracy with this model in determining who was depressed or who wasn't based on this keyboard data. And then um, they've recently improved on this model by using a different type of neural net, a convolu convolutional neural network um, combined with early fusion and also a consideration of the circadian fluctuation of keystrokes. We know that circadian rhythm dysregulation plays an important role in bipolar disorder, and so by putting that into the model, they were able to um, improve their accuracy to about 98% um, in determining who was depressed and who was not. Um, and so we've also looked at whether we can prospectively 
predict changes in mood symptoms with this keyboard data. And this is work done by Jonathan Stange, who has an interest in affective instability. So he's interested in looking at the instability of um, both the active ecological momentary assessment of mood uh, ratings that were done, as well as our passive keyboard-based measures. And he looked at whether this instability could predict prospective symptoms controlling for baseline symptoms. And he found that both instability of the daily mood rating was um, significantly um, associated with predicted elevations in HAMD scores, as well as instability in typing speed. Um, and, and both uh, passive and active measures were, were successful at predicting these increases in depression. So this pilot study done in conjunction with the University of Michigan demonstrated that we can use passive unobtrusive smartphone keyboard data um, and that they're associated with these clinician rated scales and they can be used prospectively to predict elevations in mood symptoms. Um, we were fortunate in that these participants also did neuropsychological assessments. So they had uh, trail making test uh, results as well as Tower of London test results. And we wanted to see if, if we could sort of replicate what we saw with the mood data with cognitive data. Um, and here are some of the subject characteristics. Um, the bipolar patients uh, had worse performance on the trails, and they also had um, uh, slower typing speeds. Um, the performance on the trails went away if you controlled for differences in age and education, but the typing metrics actually remained significantly slower in the bipolar patients. And just looking at a straight correlation, we see that typing speed correlates with psychomotor processing speed as assessed with the trail making test, both parts A and part B. And that's sort of a simple, intuitive um, uh, result that the faster you type, the faster you can perform on this neuropsychological test. But we also wanted to take a more sophisticated uh, approach to the data using um, a dynamical systems approach where we want to try to um, get meaningful information from seemingly um, random data. And to do this, we use sample entropy analysis, which has been successfully used to look at EEG data and EMG data, as well as EKG data and looking at heart rate variability. It's also been used to look at postural sway in patients with Parkinson's disease. And this is just to show you what this dynamic data looks like. So what you have on the x-axis is the order of the key press, and on the y-axis is the interkey interval, or the time in between key presses. And so this is the type of data that we're applying the sample entropy analysis to. And just to explain sample entropy analysis, which was done by our colleagues Alexander Demos and John Bark, um, it's basically looking at the ratio of complete patterns, shown in this example, uh, to broken patterns shown in this example. And if you look at different um, types of signal data, this type of data is very um, highly ordered, it's regular, this is, and this one is a little bit more complex, and then you have uh, more like random noise here, and those would have different levels of entropy. So the more ordered signal has low entropy, the noisy signal has very high entropy, and you have a complex signal with entropy in the middle, and to make this even more clear, I have um, text examples here where you have a very ordered series of text. Some of you may recognize this from The Shining. And then you have um, random letters here, and then um, this from uh, Shakespeare as representing the more complex signal. So more entropy isn't necessarily a good thing. Uh, less entropy isn't necessarily a good thing either. So it's a happy medium that we're looking for. And you can look at entropy across different time scales and look at the spectral qualities of the signal. And we use both approaches in the following analysis. So we were looking at entropy of move times on the Tower of London task, where the, goal, the, the point of the task is to take the uh, balls and the pegs from a start state to a goal state in as few as moves as possible. And so our intuition was that if people are doing the task impulsively, they might have a very quick first move, realize they messed up, and then have slower moves or more irregular move times. Whereas if you did it in a planful way, you would sort of think about it, you might have a long first move, but all the subsequent moves should be fairly regular um, because you've thought it out in advance. And so um, by looking at move times and entropy, we were trying to get at this um, ability to plan and, and not be impulsive. And then we wanted to do the same thing with the keyboard data, looking at the entropy of key presses, uh, where if you have a more regular 
um, series of key presses, then you have reduced entropy. If it's more irregular, you'd have increased entropy. And our hypothesis was that the bipolar patients would have um, higher entropy on the Tower of London task move times, and that would be reflective of poor planning or impulsivity. And then that would also be reflected in increased um, entropy of the typing dynamics. Um, and here are the subject characteristics and their performance on the Tower of London task. Um, the bipolar patients did take longer to solve the puzzle and they had more legal moves. Um, this was not statistically significant, but the duration of um, time to solve the puzzle was. And we found that the bipolar patients did indeed have increased entropy of um, the Tower of London move times, and they had uh, increased entropy of their keyboard dynamics. Furthermore, typing entropy was significantly correlated with the time of uh, uh, the entropy of the Tower of London task. And it was also correlated with variability in Hamilton rating scale for depression scores and variability in impulsive actions and feelings. So we see that um, just like with mood, we show that passive unobtrusive smartphone keyboard, keyboard data can be used to probe cognitive function and dysfunction in bipolar disorder. So this was done in a fairly small sample, and what we want to do now is sort of replicate and validate these findings in a larger sample, and that's what we're doing as part of the BiEffect study, um, which is ongoing. Um, so if you have an iPhone, um, you can be a part of the study, you can contribute, you can download, um, give us feedback, it's available now. Um, we've had 3,000 downloads and uh, 15,000 of typing hour, uh, hours logged. Um, we had our first um, data presentation from the BiEffect iOS sample yesterday in a poster that was done by John Bark. Um, but if you missed it, don't worry, there's a symposium tomorrow that Dr. Alex Liao um, will be presenting at showing some of that data as well. And then we also have a lot of ongoing collaborations where people are incorporating the BiEffect app into their ongoing studies. So we're working with Jay Jokola at um, UCSD who's looking at it in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. Um, we're also using, uh, looking at it in uh, marijuana users. Um, we have Rianne Moore who's in the audience um, who's using it in uh, older adults with HIV. Um, and she has a poster tomorrow on digital cognitive assessment and then um, we recently got an R01 grant. The PI is Stu Shankman at the Northwestern, and he's interested in psychomotor disturbances and mood disorders, and they also have a symposium tomorrow. Um, and you know, if you're interested in using the BiEffect app as part of your studies, you know, we're open to working with anybody. Please, please come and talk to us. And so in the future, we'd like to sort of link the two parts of the talk that I presented where um, we're looking at brain networks and these networks of smart connected devices. And we want to link um, the connectome to what um, my colleague Alex Liao calls the behaviorome, these digital behavior networks. And the idea is can we really use smartphones as stethoscopes for the brain? Um, and one of the ways we might be able to do that is to look at whether um, these multi-scale entropy measures of typing dynamics, are they related to the complexity of brain network dynamics? People have used this multi-scale entropy to look at fMRI data, and it would be interesting to see if these phenomena are linked. And can we develop other techniques um, that allow us to link uh, or reveal consistent patterns of psychopathology, uh, linking mood and cognition across time scales and across modalities? Um, and ultimately, what we want to do is create a tool that we feel will be an effective um, device for passive, unobtrusive, objective detection of affective and cognitive dysfunction um, before it's clinically apparent and maybe even have the opportunity to intervene at that time. And that's the goal that we're working towards. Um, so with that, I want to thank and acknowledge all the colleagues that contributed to the work that I talked about today. And I also want to acknowledge um, uh, the important connections in my life that make all this work possible. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you so much, bringing us right into the 21st century. <laughs> And, um, you know, I must admit that um, I'm feeling my age and, uh, you know, I'm amazed with all this technology. So what a wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we have time. I know there's probably lots of questions and indeed for the previous speakers. We've probably got time, unfortunately, just for one question. I see. Um, <laughs> would you like to? Well, I just question? got to the mic first. Um,
congratulations. Excellent presentation, all of Thanks, Ibrahim. Um, I just have one question. When I looked at your entropy data, I felt like your, your intercepts were kind of standard. I mean, they all were increased, but they were all at a static point. But mm -hmm. your slopes were different. Right. Right? Well, so, uh, let's go back. This one? So, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question is, is there, I mean, is there like a s central point of chaos that cuts across psychiatric systems which, with the worsening slope in bipolar? Yeah, that we, yeah, we don't know yet. Um, there's a, a paper uh, by Yang and Tsai where they talk about whether psychiatric illness is complex and they talk about entropy and whether you can look at different uh, types of psychopathology along this spectrum of uh, very ordered to complex to sort of random noise. Um, and I don't think we have enough data to know if that's the case. Thank you.